day, viewers, and welcome to another edition of our Cancer with Dr. Denise Edjo, the CEO of Commonwealth Cancer Foundation, in partnership with Plus TV Africa. We want to thank you once again for joining us as we discuss what's going on in this cancer space from the perspective of advocates. 2023, we are on a mission to make a statement. Cancer advocates and cancer patients will be the drivers of our conversation throughout the year. Hopefully, we will get through to all those that are in our positions and are battling with this disease and those that have gone out, gone, come out of it, they're going to give us some insight. So today in the house, I've got two powerful advocates from two very different perspectives. I want to thank you ladies for joining us. So today, what are we talking about? The Cancer Advocates' contribution to closing the care gap. First, we've got in the house, Tiwa. Tiwa Onosunya. Tiwa Onosunya is a publisher, mindset stylist, philanthropist, and the founder CEO of Exquisite Magazine, Exquisite Magazine Cancer Care Foundation. Woo! I didn't even know that that's who you are. <laughs> All right, then. Welcome. <laughs> welcome on this space. So we then have in the house Ola BC. Ola BC, Ola Dinon a breast cancer survivor. And obviously is the founder of Win Cancer Foundation. Win Cancer Foundation's mission is to support cancer patients and survivors, including their caregivers, to provide emotional counseling support, uh, respite, including financial support. Oh, wow. Thank you very much. You see, this, you see when you have powerful women in the house, we have to, we have to, we have to recognize you guys, man. So today, we're going to be talking about the challenges um, February 4th is the World Cancer Day and the theme of World Cancer Day is closing the care gap. Now, both parties or all of us on this platform are in one way funding, supporting or stakeholders in the discussion on what constitutes closing the care gap, especially as patients or patient advocates. So let me read out something that I, uh, has just been posted in the last 24 hours. The UICC, now the UICC is the Union for International Cancer Control President, has highlighted a very big concern that I think the world needs to be aware of, and Nigeria needs to really take cognizance of what is going on. In January 2023, it has been stated that there are an additional 1.8 million people diagnosed with cancer globally. I said January 2023. This is 2023, January. Yes, we're now entering February, and this is what we're hearing. And sadly, in the same January, this is January 2023, around 900,000 people have already died right. of cancer. Welcome to our conversation about what is going on in our space. So briefly, I want us to share... Um, your cancer story. So when I use the word cancer story, I have an advocate and a cancer patient. So let me, a cancer survivor. Let me start with the cancer story of BC. All right. Good, good morning, everyone. I'm here in the United States. It's still morning. Um, so my story is a very interesting one. I was diagnosed with um, breast cancer at the age of, I think I was 26 or 27. Um, yeah, 26. It's been 14 years now. Um, the first of my family, so there's no history of cancer in my family, not any kind of cancer. Um, when I got my dad, so at the age of 16, actually, I did discover a lump on my left breast and we had a lumpectomy and it was benign. And then when I discovered the um, lump on my right breast so many years ago, I went through chemotherapy, lumpectomy and, um, radiation. Five years later, the cancer returned and, um, at that time, I decided to go through mastectomy. The first time that I had this cancer, no one talked to me about mastectomy. If I did have that option then, or if I was aware of it, I would have opted for mastectomy. But it was less awareness. I was in panic. I just wanted to survive. So I was in survival mode. And whatever it is that my doctor said, I was going for it. I never did any kind of questioning. Didn't do a lot of research because as far as I was concerned, cancer was a white person's disease. So when, you know, when he hit me, I was like, oh my God, when I'm black, <laughs> you know, and in the whole process of all of this, um, going through this journey, 
um, in researching and getting more information about cancer, I realized that it was very important to, first of all, create the awareness. So awareness was the first thing that brought me cancer up. And as I was getting into the awareness, I realized that there was a lot of um, needs outside of awareness. And so that's how we get that win cancer. So that's just brief. There's a lot of more story behind that, but just to be brief. No, but actually that is an interesting start to the conversation because you are breast cancer survivor turned advocate. Uh, Tewa, you are an advocate. You are throwing a lot of weight behind the advocacy. Why? What brought you to our space? What... What are you hoping to achieve? Maybe it's too many questions, so just try and I will come back to some of them, I'm sure. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And I have to say that both you, both you ladies are warriors. You are fighting the fight and you are winning. So I'm, um, you know, I'm very, very, um, I'm congratulating, congratulating you both. I'm very excited to, to be on here. So yes, I am an advocate and people always assume that, you know, maybe I have a story to tell or something's happened in the past. And that is why I'm advocating, strongly advocating, especially for cervical cancer. And it's just because I, I, I feel like I am blessed to be, um, to have been in a, in a, in a culture where as long as you're sexually active or you get to about, um, age 20, 21, they force you. And when I say force you, they don't, you know, tell you nicely to go and get screened for cervical cancer. They actually, you know, they tell you to get screened. If you're not getting screened, they send you a letter. If you're not responding to the letter, they would call you to go and have your screening done. And that's because a lot of women are dying from a, a cancer that is 100% preventable and they want to stop it. And then I moved to Nigeria, well, kind of like started going back and forth to Nigeria in 2000 and 2008, 2009, thereabouts. And one day I was speaking to one of my friends who, you know, at that time we both had two children. And, um, you know, I was just talking to her and saying that, oh, I'm going back to England. I, I have a, a smear test, a pap smear um, booth that I have to do. And then she was like, what are you talking about? I'm like, huh? What do you mean, what am I talking about? This was the first time that it actually occurred to me that not everybody, even people that are educated, not everybody knew about cervical cancer. They didn't even know. And she was looking at me with a blank face, like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, you know, the test for cervical cancer that you have to do every three years. She was blank. We've had two children. That means, and the reason I keep saying we've had children is because even after I had my son, they did a swap to just check that everything is normal. And I'm thinking to her, you know, have you never had, she said, no, she's never had a, a screening and she doesn't even know what I'm talking about. So at that stage, we'd started Exquisite Magazine. I think Ex Exquisite started in 2002, sorry, 2003. So we've been a few years into that. And then, you know, so I came to England, did the test, but I was a little bit worried. And I was scared as well. So I started doing a bit of research. And then I found out that according to the WHO report, one woman dies every hour of cervical cancer in Nigeria. I was like, what? And apparently, well, and one woman every minute of breast, of breast cancer. And then I kept reading on, reading on. And I'm like, oh my God, this is, this is, no, this is not acceptable. And because my magazine is a magazine that, you know, where fashion, beauty, wellness, lifestyle for women, who else should advocate for this other than the magazine? That was why in 2010, we started something called the Exquisite Magazine Fashion Party, where we thought, okay, let's use fashion to bring people in and then tell them about, you know, tell them about cervical cancer. And in the following year, we were able to raise a bit more money. We were like, okay, you know what, let's do a fashion party, then get everybody to get screened on the day. And we did. That day, we were able to screen 100 people. Guess what? We had 20 people with pre-cancer cells. This was in 2011. Unbelievable. And then by 2012, we were like, okay, you know what? Instead of all these monies we raised to God's glory, even though we don't raise the amount that we want, but these little monies that we raise, instead of doing a fashion party where we have to pay models, we have to pay makeup artists, let's do a walk. Let's do a walk where bulk of the money we now have will go towards screening people. So what we started to do was, okay, yeah, let's do a walk, raise awareness. And the big thing for us is raising the awareness because we found out that 
Nobody, no, and, and when I say nobody, maybe like 0.001% of people in Nigeria then know about cervical cancer because we did it. I don't know if you if you're familiar with the with the Palms, the shopping mall in Lagos. We did a survey in 2000, and, I think 2011 or so. We did a survey at the Palms, and about 99% of the women didn't know about cervical cancer, and then the ones that knew haven't been screened at all, never. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. So we began, you know, just trying the best we can, raising awareness. So what we started doing is with the magazine, we would put a sticker on the on the cover of the magazine saying cervical cancer is preventable, go and get screened. We just wanted more and more people to know about it. And then we began the screening and then we said, okay, you know what? People know, people get screened. What happens after? It needs to be out there as well that January is a key month for women. For cervical cancer, yes. We all, we all have to keep campaigning that. Um, I think mm -hmm. that, for everybody that is watching, you've all gone through the January experience and you should know that the women have been making a lot of noise and we continue to make noise. Um, and let's see how we get on. So thank you. Thank you, Tewa. Um, but I need to um, move this now. So what are your desired expectations in closing the care gap? Because we are struggling as a country and we have to be realistic but we can't keep lying about this so give me three expectations you have tell financial tell her, give me three expectations <laughs> my my huge expectation would be you know god help us funds to be directed at preventative measures and mm -hmm. also people that have already that already have cancers to be able to help them survive even better you know, I say preventative measures because the awareness is still very, very low. And if the awareness is there and people are going out to get screened and people are not scared to get screened, we will get somewhere, especially with the preventable cancers. People should know that, you know, during your period or is it after your period, feel your, you know, feel around your boobs to be able to do this. People need the information. Information is key. So when we're even talking about finance, we're not only talking about finance for treatment, we're talking about finance to, you know, make, make everything more visible, let the publicity be out there. And then, you know, having that care for people who, who already have cancer, so they, they're not dying from these cancers. Fantastic. Okay, now, I question, how many oncologists do we have in Nigeria? As of 2021, we were at 70 to 80. As of Exodus going on now, well, how many have we got left? We have a population of 200 plus million people. We have a cancer community of, at least globally now, this is one in two. So let's divide it. That is half of 130 million is 65 million that we expected to have cancer in Nigeria. Let's, let's, let's start counting these maths properly. So in my view, I'm asking now, I'm, I'm looking at this and saying to myself, okay, as an advocate, let's be honest, we are setting cancer patients up. Or are we, are we setting them up to take the screening and then we can't do anything for them? Or are we setting them up to take the screening with the hope that funding will come from somewhere? And I'm very concerned about this because I've had to examine myself and ask the question, how do you feel? How would you feel if you were the one that went for screening, you knew you had cancer and you knew that you couldn't do anything, when truthfully you could have had many years not knowing and if you found out at the very end, you don't have money to pay for it. I'm just throwing thoughts into the public air now. You understand? Let's, let's reason it out. This is not we're, not, we're not having the program because we want to just have a chat. We want to address the key things okay this is, a valid, this is a very very valid concern so when i started wing cancer i was on the same page as tiwa shocked at the fact that a lot of people were not aware of cancer like i said even i in the united states felt like it was a white man disease so you can imagine how many people have that same mindset as i did back home so awareness was very important to me but as I started the journey of creating this awareness, I realized exactly what you asked just now, Dennis. Then what? What is the next stage? There's some people that, you know, are you not better off just leaving them not knowing that they're going through this disease? 
knowing that you don't even know how to go further. The, the first awareness um, campaign that we did in Nigeria, Wind Cancer Foundation, um, in a community, we discovered about 20 women that had breast lump. And then we had to send them off for further testing. We tried a partnership, we tried to partner with um, LUT at that point. There was an oncologist at LUT that we were in good communication with. And, um, you know, we sent them out there. They, there was a lot of frustration. Some of them, because they were in, um, attended to, they never went back. You know, a few of them pulled through. And this was all self-funded. Now, in between, I think there was the next um, awareness um, run that we did. There was a set of, like, five women. And that was in my community where I grew up in Ikeja. There were five um, people that act alone. And out of those five people, we had one 16 or 17 year old girl that had a lump. Now, the question was, how do we move forward with this patient? I was very, very particular about I needed them to go further, get the test done if we had to do a biopsy. But it was very important to me that we had government funded hospitals, which were like general hospitals, right? And we didn't get the support. We didn't get the support from the hospital in bringing in those people. So you can imagine, they didn't even believe that an NGO can be self-funded. So that was a big struggle. Now, the money in having to take care of five, six patients that I discovered in that particular awareness program, I had to pour it into one patient because now I had to put agents, you know, in, into the conditions. Like she's a very young child. She has a lot in front of her. You know, I would... um put the funds and support in this person compared to trying, not that I'm saying that it's not valid that a 50 year old woman has this kind of same situation, but then you have to have to start weighing it down because now money is being played and in, factored into all of this. So for me personally, it keeps me thinking, do I really want to create this awareness in um, exposing these people to this disease? and not being able to help them further because I don't have the um, capacity to, I don't have the funding, you know, I'm not having the support of the um, oncologist. Then I came to a conclusion, I will rather partner with these hospitals. And that's one thing that Wing Cancer is very big on lately. I'm not sure if you noticed, we do a lot of awareness on social media, but now we don't really do awareness, camp awareness campaign anymore because now we partner with the hospitals, identifying patients that are struggling to pay and we pay directly to the hospital and that is a huge way to give back the way that i see it because i create this awareness i expose this person to this disease that they weren't aware of and i can't do anything to help my 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 conscience just couldn't handle it so that's where you know the wind cancer foundation community decided the team decided that that would be a better option until we find a resolution to this problem so for me that is if you think about this all the time, we create a, and I'll give you one story. There's a lady that we we actually doing our um, screening program. We detected um, a lump. She actually did have stage one cancer, and we were willing because she was young. I think 40, 35. We were willing to go ahead with the payment, and then you know she reached out to me and said, "Madam, I'd rather you give me this money. My children are not; they don't have food to eat." And you want to go pay millions of dollars to pay for my treatment. I need to be able to take care of my family, feed my family before I can think about taking care of myself. So we go through situations like that. Thank you, BC. You see, you see, when I say to you guys that this conversation is not about individuals, we all have pain in the system that we are very aware of is killing all of us because you cannot do this if you don't have the passion because you will cry sometimes. Thank you, definitely. And I do agree with you, Bissi, to or to an extent though, because I believe definitely um after you found after the person's found out they have cancer care is very, very important. But I have to say that being, um, the awareness goes hand in hand with that as well. And I'm going to speak from a cervical cancer perspective because that is the cancer that is one hundred percent preventable that you know that if they are being screened, the care, if people are being screened, if people are being tested for HPV, if children start getting vaccinated, amen by the government, we will definitely close that gap. And my, my, my big thing is we want to reduce the number of deaths from the next generation. 
Yes, when we do the screening, people will find out they do have or don't have. But the people that do have, they have to find out, you know, one way or the other, if the government can help, if personal um, if help one way or the other. And it can, you know, it can be from all different, it can be from different spaces, even NGOs as well. But I think the big thing is, yes, they might prioritize food over the care, but it's still important that they know what's happening to their bodies and not saying, oh, you know, somebody in the village, which is the, the, the thing that most people go for, especially in the in the rural areas, that's it's somebody in the village and blah, blah, blah. So the awareness needs to be there for them to know that there's something that they can do as well, just to add that. Thank you. I I totally agree with you that it comes end in end. I totally agree with you, but I'm just saying based on my experience, um, you know, yeah. I think if you have to be fair, all of us agree that, the, that all of us have different points. You see, like I always say to people, I only do awareness. I don't, I don't mm. engage with treatments and all that because I know I can't deal with it. It's like yes. telling me now, let's go and visit people in the hospital. I can't do it. I, so all of us, if all of us could stay with what our strengths are in the campaign, we most probably will do a lot better. But what we exactly. try to do is we want to be jack of all trade, master of no, none, and then we're not we're not able to measure. Yes, anyway. And I need us to be measuring progress. Okay, now, um, I if I asked, so let me put it this way: if asked to name one thing, please, you want the world to do for us in Nigeria, that, that is the different cancer global organizations that can support us because 80% of Nigerians are dying of cancer. So there's no need. Meanwhile, 80% of cancer patients in the world are living. So let's one thing that you feel that um, we need to do because that's a question I had to answer. So I want to know um, your views. And my focus specifically on research funding or strategic emotional and financial aid for those with long-term disease yeah that is because you can't pay for you can't pay for if you're long-term disease you're, you're you're broke you become homeless you, you don't have anything so everything goes and with the current global economy that has been going on it's worse okay so it's very fast now. <laughs> what is yours? You see, those are very key, right? So since you've already um, pointed that out, I'll go on the next level, which would be subsidized funding for treatments. That is very huge because when you think about, I mean, like I said, when cancer pays for a lot of treatments for patients. And when we think about what it costs to actually get a scan, a radiation, get um chemotherapy it is killing it is not an average nigerian cannot afford to pay for one treatment not one circle and then you see them go through six cycles of chemotherapy so for me it is big that government is able to subsidize treatment um subsidize funding for treatments for cancer patients thank you, thank you. Tara, <laughs> what is your one and thing and why my one thing, and that's because you've mentioned finance, and I think you've both mentioned finance, and I think it goes under finance as well, is free screening, free screening for cervical cancer, free screening, free screening. Thank you. That's what I would say. And reason being, cervical cancer is 100% preventable yeah. if caught early. So let people who are sexually active get free screening. And I suppose it goes under finance because the government would need to put a, you know, a budget to do, to be able to do that. But free screening, if we're saying we want to close, <laughs> I go on, I know, but it's just okay. something that I'm just like, you know. So no, 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 it, no, but it's fair. It's a fair comment because free screening is free screening. You see, like, like, like that's what we're trying to address. So I agree with you. And we're now in a place where, um, I, from what I understand, Nigeria has now gotten to the point where we are going for, what's it called? We're going for uh, the second, third quarter mm. under, under 16s will now have access to free screen. So all of us are here now. We're going to be police people. We're going to monitor this thing last, last. Okay. Because we have to make sure that it does happen. And we want to see 
we want them to give us numbers because nobody wants to give us numbers. We can't mm -hmm. continue. They say we're, we're screening. How many? We don't yet know. We want to know. So let's keep an eye on that space. And as we are, as I, I think as we get ready to round up, I want us to quickly just, you all will give me one goodwill message to the cancer patient survivors. One goodwill message. Um, I think the message will be to remember to think healthy. In as much as, you know, they're going through what they're going through, remember to think healthy and think happy thoughts. I strongly believe, and this is from my mindset background, mindset styling background, I strongly believe that everything we win and lose in our minds first. And if you already feel, you know, very low, like it's not going to happen, you're not going to be healed and things like that, that's what will happen. So I would say fill your mind with, you know, fill your mind with happy thoughts. Think health. Think yourself healthy and you will. And I loved what you said at the beginning that you use comedy <laughs> to just, you know, to just work with life. So one way or the other, just, you know, find a way, find what works for you and make sure that every single day you're living the best and you're living in that moment. Cancer is not a death sentence. Yeah. You know, and I tell everybody that. Mm -hmm. And I, I leave everyone with that. Like, if I go to speak, if I cancel with people, I would always remind them, no matter what it is that you're going through, cancer mm -hmm. is a death sentence. It is very important to keep communication open. They Thank say you. a problem, a problem, um, a problem, problem shared. shared. Yeah, a problem asked. shared is a problem solved. Solved. So cancer is not a death sentence. A death sentence. I want to thank you, ladies, very much for your time for engaging with me today. Uh, I want to, I want to say to the viewers, we're all sitting here and we laugh. We laugh because you have to have some level of finding yourself in the midst of any storm. And no matter how hard this or what you see as a storm raging, please reach out for help. You can find all my guests are on the social media spaces. So Tewa, please, can you quickly give us your handle? Okay. Ours is at IMAC underscore Cervical Cancer Foundation. IMAC, E-M-A-C. Thank you. And the same and applies to you. Win Cancer Foundation on yeah. Instagram. Win Cancer Foundation, okay. W-I-N. Cancer Foundation. Thank you, ladies. I really appreciate your time. I really appreciate what you've done uh, at Poem Plus TV. We really appreciate your engaging in this conversation. Follow us on our social media page, Commode Cancer Foundation. Uh, we've got a YouTube page which will host these videos. So like them, share them, and, and, and the more we share, the more we like, the more we spread the message. So thank you, Plus TV, for funding this campaign and for encouraging us to continue. We really appreciate all that you're all doing. And to all those out there, together we fight, together we win. We will get through this, no matter what the battle is. Thank you all, and have a lovely, lovely day.